Surrealist Constitutions in Southeast Asia was co-edited by me and my collaborator, Bui Ngok Son. In conceptualizing this book, we wanted to present an idea of constitutions beyond what is usually a more status and monist perspective on constitutional law. We think that constitutions, in fact, take into account a plurality of sources, a plurality of interests, and a plurality of ideologies, and often are a product of compromises among different groups. And this, we think, has not been sufficiently captured by existing scholarship. And so in presenting this edited volume, we wanted to um, sketch out a way to think about constitutional law that um, gives full credence to the plurality that is underlying these constitutions. So in this particular book, we have focused on constitutions in Southeast Asia because we think that Southeast Asia presents an important and fascinating region for study. Many constitutions in Southeast Asia are post-colonial constitutions, which means that they have, come, um, they have been developed in a way that takes into account not just local traditional sources of law, but also um, colonial sources of law. And they have had to grapple with the layering of colonial institutions over traditional cultures and political cultures. In addition to the plurality of law and political institutions, we also often see a plurality of ethnic and religious groups. And this presents both a fascinating area for compromises, for political settlements, as well as for innovation. And so in this particular book, we want to take diversity, we want to take plurality seriously, and to really consider how such plurality can be addressed in a constitutional system that does not seek to eliminate this plurality, but grapple with them and manage them in a way that will allow for peaceful coexistence in the long run. Constitutionalism in Asia is a book series which I've put together uh, with uh, publishers Hart, uh, together with my colleague Tio Lian. Uh, the idea behind this book was really uh, an upshot of a book which I did together with uh, two other colleagues uh, in Taiwan, Ye Jinrong and Chen Wenzhen, uh, called Constitutionalism in Asia, Cases and Materials. And in the course of doing this book, we felt that there was a serious gap in the English uh, literature relating to constitutional law and constitutional matters in Southeast Asia as well as in Asia uh, generally. So that's when we thought maybe it would be useful to have a book series that would invite contributions in the English language, make available in the English language uh, scholarly works relating to uh, the constitutions of uh, this part of the world. Um, the book, uh, Constitutional Foundings in Southeast Asia, has its roots in a 2004 article that I had written for the then uh, Journal of, uh, Singapore Journal of International and Comparative Law called The Making and Remaking of Constitutional Orders in Southeast Asia. At that point in time, uh, I found it very, very difficult to gather historical materials in the English language uh, and writings relating to the history of constitution making and constitutional development in Southeast Asia. And so when uh, 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 I published the article and found that quite a number of people had made reference to it, uh, I had a very nice conversation with uh, Nui Bok Song, who was then uh, at our Centre for Asian Legal Studies, and he convinced me that it was maybe worthwhile to put together a volume that would bring together specialists from different parts of uh, specialising in different parts of Southeast Asia, talking about the very first constitutions. And in the belief that first things do matter, first constitutions do have rather long lives. They may exist for a very short time, they may be uh, replaced by subsequent constitutions, but the ideas as well as the structures that were built in, the thinking that went behind those constitutions very often lingered on long after these constitutions are gone. And of course, some of these constitutions actually still remain with us.
It used to be that Asian students turned to Western authors to understand more of Asia. These uh, two books are part of a new wave of scholarship. They don't focus just on one country. They have a broad regional focus that enables us to do a comparative study of Asian legal systems. They don't focus just on law as a technical field, just as a body of rules to be mechanically applied. Uh, the, uh, they look at law as a social phenomenon, at, at law as, uh, as, a, um, as a historical process, as part of a historical process. And in that sense, these two works, one on uh, pluralism and the other on constitutional foundings, both help us understand more the, uh, the world that we have carved out for ourselves here in Asia and look at the, um, the, the post-colonial developments using, um, using law as a unique expression of the needs of, um, of a specific period. I congratulate the editors and contributors for these two volumes. They have chosen two wonderful themes each theme complementing the other. The, the, the editors have assembled uh, wonderful uh, 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 teams of, um, of, of writers to contribute uh, to, the, uh, to the volumes. And I am sure that these volumes will have an impact on, uh, on Asian scholarship and on the region's understanding of itself. Congratulations. I would like to congratulate my friend Kevin, Jacqueline, Theo Rian, and lots of friends here in, at NUS. They did a great job by compiling all the essays and come up with these edited volumes. These two volumes are great. They touch upon the heart of Asia. They also touch upon the main issue of Asia. We know these two books represent the transformation of the research in East Asia, in Southeast Asia. We used to look into one state, at one case. You know, at some time we may refer to, you know, United States, jurisprudence, or Europe. We never talk to each other. And now, people began to put context into the study. And they did a great job by compiling all the states into the study. With that, all the context has been shown by the, each individual authors. So when we say context, history began to play a role. Economic condition, social structure, religion, belief, embedded values of the society, family, you know, things like that began to come into play in the study, making the constitutional study even more you know, interesting and functional. So they did a great job by doing that. Particularly when you go from text to that context, you know, we were able to look into the divergent, uh, divergent features of Asian states. Not only that, in the past, we don't talk to each other. Right now, we talk to neighbors. So scholars talk to scholars in this region and they began to compare cases, theories, or even context. So with that, we find that the, what we call regional constitutionalism actually is forming. I'm hoping that in the future, this plurality and also founding constitution, these two themes will be uh, researched and also elaborated even further. It's a wonderful honor and pleasure to be here today for the launch of this brand new book series. And I really want to congratulate Professor Kevin Tan and Lian Tio uh, for launching this book series because it is very important. In the past, 
the leading theory on constitutional law and constitutionalism in the English language literature has traditionally been based in the West. Indeed, even ironically, the study of Asian constitutional law, a lot of the leading work has come out of the West. And although this work has been great and it has contributed a lot um, to the development of the law and legal scholarship in this area, it is very important that we develop within Asia a voice that is coming from Asia to influence how the law is developing around the world. And this book series on constitutionalism in Asia is a wonderful example of how that can be done. How we can reorient the leading work on Asian law from the West back to its natural home in Asia. And once again, I would really like to congratulate uh, Kevin Tan and Lian Tio for this terrific accomplishment because I think this is fulfilling the ultimate mission of the Center for Asian Legal Studies at NUS, which is to have a leading center on Asian law in Asia, for Asia, but indeed for the entire world.